is I'm going to talk to you today about baptism. Last week, we spent an entire Sunday talking about salvation, what it means to follow Christ, what it means to, to give your life to him, to confess your sin, to believe who Jesus is, and to trust him and decide to make him both your Savior and your Lord. The week before last week, we baptized an entire family, which was awesome. We had five people plus myself in the baptistry, so we now know uh, what the baptistry will hold. Maybe we're going to go for six next time, but baptism is something we do in the life of the church. It's something we do because God commanded us to do it. Now, I want to just remind you and ask you a favor as your pastor and your friend, as we begin together. Today, I don't want you to get mad at me because I probably will step on your toes. And uh, I don't mean to step on your toes because I love you. I'm your friend, your pastor. We've been through a lot together, many of us, uh, but I'm going to talk to you honestly. I'm going to talk to you from the Bible. And I'm going to talk to you about something that may um, make you a little bit defensive about possibly the way you've grown up or what your grandmother or your priest or your pastor taught you. And it's not my intention. My intention is to take you to the word, to the Bible, and encourage you to think biblically and to make some decisions for yourself based on the scripture that I show you. Baptism can be a very emotional kind of an issue or a subject or a topic. And even in the first service, when I started preaching and talking about it, uh, there were some people who kind of folded their arms and sort of looked at me like, all right, we know where you're going. We don't want to hear it. You do want to hear it because you want to hear what the Bible has to say. You have to decide what kind of a Christian you are. And a lot of it has to do with the tradition that you were brought up in. Many denominations and faith traditions uh, do not encourage the people who are in their congregations and in their denominations or faith traditions to spend a lot of time reading the word of God, to spend a lot of time studying the word for yourself, to spend a lot of time trying to find out what God's word says and to do that. And if you were part of a tradition or a denomination or a faith group that didn't really encourage you to explore the Bible for yourself and you didn't have a pastor who pointed out what the Bible said and gave an explanation as to why we do what we do based on scripture, then you were part of a tradition or a denomination or a faith group that um, allowed the church to dictate what you do and how you practice your faith. If you're part of a tradition, which I would consider myself and us as a church family to be part of, a tradition who allows the Bible to be the sole authority for what we do and what we believe, then everything we practice, we have to be able to point directly to scripture and say, this is why and this is how. And so if you grew up in a tradition that said, maybe we appreciate the Bible, well, we have a respect for it. Possibly even we think it's true, but you didn't really spend a lot of time personally engaging, um, then uh, this may be a little bit of a stretch for you. It might be a little bit of a thinker and that's okay. If you're joining us online, they have all different denominations and faith traditions here and everybody is welcome. I love the diversity that we have at Capital City Church, but today my goal is clarity. My goal is to take you to scripture and to explain to you what the history of baptism is, what it meant then, what it means now. In the second part of my message, I'm gonna to talk to you about the modes of baptism. I'm gonna to talk to you about sprinkling. I'm gonna to talk to you about infant baptism. I'm gonna to talk to you about is baptism necessary for salvation and explain to you why we do baptism the way we do baptism. And so uh, again, I'll ask that you hear me out and the spirit that I love to communicate to you in, which is one of we're friends and we open the word, we look at the word, has, what the word has to say. And when we explore and discover what the word has to say, then that's the authority and that's why we do what we do. I encourage you to challenge me whenever I preach. Don't do it while I'm preaching, do it later. But if I'm saying something to you and you're wondering where it comes from, where, it's, where it is, where it's based in scripture and you can't find it for yourself, ask. And if I can't give you a good biblical explanation, then you have absolute reason to question. But we try to let the word of God be our sole authority for what we do and what we believe. And that's where I place my confidence. I have no confidence in a denomination, in a man, in a diocese, in a pope, in anybody else to decide what God wants or what God says. I have confidence in the Holy Spirit as he inspired scripture to human authors who pin scripture and the Holy Spirit's ability to illuminate that truth and to pinpoint that truth to our life. So that's where I'm coming from, which might give you a clue as to who may 
have a little bit more time or hard, harder time kind of dealing with the stuff that we're going to be dealing with. Jesus' command to us, one that he gave, one that's familiar to you, is one that I'm going to start us off with. It is a command that he gave as he was on his way out, on his way up, and uh, his work on earth was done. And he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, we love to get stuck on the all nations part, and we don't go any further. But the next part is really important. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And then he dropped the mic and he was out. Boom, gone. Ascended into heaven the way he had come in the first place. And the disciples sat around and waited for him to come back. And we're still waiting today for Jesus to come back. But his command was that we baptize now, baptism was not a spiritual word. It's not a word that the Holy Spirit invented and dropped in the, the human author's ear and said, I want you to make up a mystical word that carries with it all kinds of crazy connotations and people are gonna be confused, but it's okay. And uh, it's just a common word. And what baptism means is to dunk. It means to wash, it means to immerse. It means that um, you're gonna take something, you're gonna put it in water. It was used of washing clothes. It was used of pickles. There was a guy, he was a physician and a poet. Interesting guy, I'm guessing, a real Renaissance man who is famous for his pickle recipe. More than the pickle recipe, I was surprised they had cucumbers back in, in uh, 200 AD or BC. But Nicander was a person who wrote a pickle recipe. And in his pickle recipe, which was recorded over time, as some recipes are, he said, to make pickles, you bapto a cucumber in boiling water, which is a form of baptism. You baptize or immerse it in vinegar, and then the two together make a pickle. And it wasn't that it made a supernatural spiritual pickle that it took on some kind of a mystical life of its own and became a relic or something else. It was just a pickle. It was a word that was used that was common and, and it means to dip. And historically, the word has been used for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. In Hebrew, there was a word for it that became a Greek word for it. But the weird thing is, that when the Bible was translated into English, they didn't translate the word baptize. They just left it in its Greek. If they had translated it, it probably would have said to dip or to wash. It would have been really simple, but they didn't. They just left it as baptize, which leaves us with some confusion. Let's say that there was a man in Jesus' day who wanted to become a Jew. Now, I'm not sure why anybody would really want to do that, and you'll see why in a second. But he had been hearing some Jews talk. Let's say maybe this man's father was a, a, a Greek, his mother was a Roman. He was sort of interested in this coming Messiah. The Old Testament law was intriguing him. So he goes to his priest or to a priest and says, tell me what it takes to be a Jew. And the priest says, I'm glad you asked. Here are five things you have to do to become a Jew. The first one was the hardest of any of them, and you'll see why. And if this was a prerequisite in our membership classes to Capital City Church, we probably have a whole lot less takers. But the first one was circumcision. That could have been a deal killer, right? It, for some reason, that was funny to me. And you guys are just looking at me. <laughs> it was there, I'm telling you. And um, I'll tell you a quick story, which my wife says is a junior high humor story. But I was just starting out in ministry as a full-time college and young singles pastor. And I took a whole bunch of college students to a conference. And the, the speaker was talking about the David and Goliath story. I'm telling them the story, Joy. And uh, the, uh, the, the speaker had an interpreter, sign language interpreter. And the pastor kept calling Goliath the uncircumcised Philistine and said it over and over and over again. And I kept looking for the sign for that, thinking it would be something really cool. And I was really disappointed when they just spelled it out, but they had to spell it real quick because there are a lot of letters, but it was just a part of Old Testament life. And it was a part of becoming a Jew, circumcision. It was a hard part, but it was a part. So that was the first thing. The guy stuck around and he said, okay, what's number two? He goes, well, you got to embrace the law of Moses. The first five books of the Old Testament, you got to embrace the, what the prophets had to say. And then by the way, we've got a whole bunch of laws that we've added on that we'd like you to follow. The third thing, was a ceremonial meal that they had to, to, to uh, eat, which wasn't a big deal. The fourth thing, they had to offer a Gentile sacrifice at the temple. Here's the fifth thing. They had to be baptized, which involved a very simple process of them taking themselves and putting themselves in a big pot of water, a cistern, not a brethren, a cistern, 
And that was a dumb joke. I'm just, you guys, you weren't with me in the number one, so I wanted to make sure you were with me with number five. I, that really was bad, I know. But they, would, they would put themselves in the pot, and bloop, they would immerse themselves in water, which symbolized death to the old life. And when they came up out of the water, it symbolized a new life, a new life for them in Judaism. It was symbolic. They baptized themselves. So then before the time of Jesus, or really around the time of Jesus, you have a man named John the Baptist. Anybody ever heard of John the Baptist? If you've uh, spent any time in church, you grew up in Sunday school, John the Baptist. When I was a kid, I thought the Bible was calling John the Baptist, John the Baptist, because he was Baptist. And he had a wife named Mary the Presbyterian, and he had an uncle named Bob the Methodist. And it wasn't that at all. Um, John was a, a person who was a cousin of Jesus, but he was called to prepare the way for the Messiah for, for Jesus. And one of the ways he did that was preaching. And the second way he did that was baptizing. And so he would go down to the river, to the Jordan River, and he would baptize people out of the Jewish faith into a group of people who believed John's message, which was Jesus is coming. He's coming quickly. And so instead of just becoming practicers of the Jewish faith. They became waiters and watchers in anticipation. And the baptism, which was, by the way, as you'll see, done by immersion, was symbolic of death to their Jewish way of life and then raised up to live a different way. I'll read to you about John's baptism. In those days, John the Baptist, he came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. Can you picture this guy? And he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. Then they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now, let me remind you what the word baptism means. It means to dunk, to dip, to wash. And so Jews who wanted to believe John's message about Jesus would come down, they would listen to him preach, and they would say, I want to be one of you. I want to be one of the watchers, one of the waiters. And so they would line up and they'd come down off the bank into the water and John would baptize them. Now, let's fast forward just a little bit because it's all included in the same passage. And now you see John looking up at the bank and pointing his finger and he's saying, behold, the one I've been telling you about is here. So everybody up on the bank, they turn and they look, who in the world are they talking about? And they see Jesus standing there and they start whispering, that's John's cousin. And John's saying, no, this is the, 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 the one, the Messiah the one who's come to fulfill the prophecy. And everyone turns and looks at Jesus and Jesus does the most astonishing thing. You see, there's two iterations of baptism that I've talked to you about already. The first one was Jewish baptism. The second one was John's baptism. Well, this kind of begins the third and final iteration of baptism. And this is Jesus' baptism. And so Jesus didn't just stand there on the bank listening to John's sermon going, you know, good job, man, you're, you're preaching the truth. He walks down in the water. Well, let me read it to you, okay? Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Now, the ironic thing is, is that John probably hadn't even been baptized himself. Now, I don't know that for sure, but all of history and all of scripture, nowhere do you ever find anyone who ever baptized anyone else. It was always the person baptizing themselves into the cistern to become part of the Jewish faith. Never had you seen anyone baptize anybody else. John was the first one on record. And as far as we know, the very first one. And so Jesus shows up and he comes down to be baptized by John. But John said, you're not gonna be baptized by me. He said, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, no, you're going to baptize me. And then John said, no, uh, no, you're going to baptize me. And Jesus said, no, you're going to baptize me. And John's like, I can't baptize you. And so they finally worked it out. And Jesus went down into the water and John baptized him. Jesus replied, let me read that last one there. I kind of jumped the slides there. Jesus replied, let it be so now. 
it's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Now, as soon as Jesus was baptized, immersed, dunked, washed, submerged, he came up out of the water, which you don't come up out of the water unless what? You go down into the water, very logical progression. And at that moment, heaven opened up and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Now, people get preoccupied with the dove. There are a couple times in scripture where the Holy Spirit showed who he was in bodily form. This is one of those times that symbolized God's pleasure that Jesus was doing this, but it also symbolized that Jesus had come to take the baton from John, like a relay race, and agree, I am the one who you've been looking for. I'm gonna complete the work. So he takes the baton and Jesus takes off running for the next couple, two and a half, two and three quarters years of his ministry. And what used to be people becoming Jewish, then becoming Johnish, now they were becoming followers of Christ. And it was a public demonstration of a person's internal choice to follow Jesus. Huh. So off Jesus went. Remember the words in Matthew when Jesus said, I want you to go and I want you to baptize. I want you to encourage people to receive the message that I am the Messiah, that I'm paying the price for your sins, that anyone who confesses sin and believes in me and chooses to follow me and follow me alone won't have to perish, but will have new life through me. I want you to go and teach people to step out in faith, to make a public declaration of faith after conversion, which we'll talk about in a few minutes and say, I'm one of you. And we, we follow him. I can't wait to come back and finish this because it's gonna be really, really fun. Father, thank you. So as a review or a reminder, we have three different iterations of baptism. The first one was Jewish baptism and Jewish baptism was done um, as a part of a person who wasn't a Jew wanting to become a Jew and they baptized themselves. Then you have John's baptism and John's baptism was a baptism out of Judaism into identifying with a group of people who were waiting on the imminent arrival of the Messiah. Now, what I didn't tell you is there were two people who were listening to John's message, at least two, we don't know exactly how many. And um, John, shortly after Jesus was baptized by him, he continued preaching, continued baptizing. He was arrested. Now, you probably remember me talking about this and he was thrown into prison. And there were two people who, when John was arrested, decided, man, we've got to take this message worldwide. We can't just let it die because John could be killed any day. And so these two took off and they began to preach John's message. When they preached John's message, they were preaching the message of repent from your sins because there's a Messiah that's coming. We need to be watching for him. He's coming soon. You can read this story in Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, the apostle Paul himself runs into these two people who are preaching this message. Repent because Jesus is gonna come. He's gonna come soon. We need to be watching for the Messiah. Now, the problem is that by this time, Jesus had already come. He'd already lived the last part of his life, almost three years. He had already died on the cross, already rose again. And um, it was all taken care of, it was all finished. And they were preaching an incomplete message. And so Paul said, listen, you guys have most of it right, but you don't know the good news. The good news is that Jesus is here. He has come, he's done it, he's gone, he's waiting. You know, gave him, he filled him in. And they said, man, our belief wasn't wrong. It was just incomplete. And so what did, what did they do? They got baptized in Jesus' name. And I want you to put that in the back of your mind as an encouragement to you that if the information that you have had growing up or at some point in your life was incomplete, and now you receive complete information that you could respond just like these two preachers, these disciples of John. So we have Jesus baptism. Jesus baptism is believer's baptism. It's what we understand and practice today. And I wanna remind you one last time, the tradition we come from 
is a Bible tradition, not a church first tradition. So I'm taking you to the word. And as you find things that you may disagree with, I encourage you to research them for yourself and go and ask people who may have taught you a different way where they get what they taught you and just find out if it came from scripture or if it came from tradition and then you decide who you trust. So let's look together at Christian baptism. It still symbolizes repentance, cleansing, and commitment like John's, but Jesus has given it a different emphasis, an identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So it's complete. Everyone baptized now is identifying with Jesus, which means that it is a public declaration of an inward decision, and that's what Christian baptism is today. There are four points that I want to to make with you or for you. And that first one is that baptism is simply an outward, visible sort of identification to the condition of your heart. It's a ceremonial act undertaken after a person accepts Christ. Pay close attention to that as his or her Lord and Savior. And this is usually done in the presence of the church body as a public proclamation of faith. The only thing or only part about that statement that's not 100% biblical and directed directly at scripture or from scripture is the last part. That baptism, and I said usually done in the presence of a body of believers because there were times or a time in scripture where baptism was done privately in a puddle. But in general, to publicly identify, it was done in a group. And the whole point was you were coming out and saying, I am part of a Christian body, Christ followers. And so it was a demonstration. Here's what I say when I baptize. It comes straight from scripture, from the book of Romans. I'd like to read that together if we do. Romans 6, 3 and 4. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Here it is, it might sound familiar to you. We were therefore buried with him through baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we may too live a new life. Now, when I baptize people, what I say is not magic. It's not anything that makes somebody a believer, but it's biblical. And what I'll say is when I baptize you, buried with Christ in baptism unto death because under the water immersion is the picture of Christ's death raised to walk in newness of life. And I say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because that's how we're taught to baptize. Some people along the way have messed it up. There's a whole cult, a whole heresy called the Pentecostal oneness heresy where they say baptize in the name of Jesus only and they get crazy about it. We as even Baptists, past Baptists, and I grew up as a Baptist and I wasn't a landmark Baptist, but there was a whole group of Baptists that believed that if you wanted to join a church, you had to be baptized into that church. And so every church you went to, you had to get re-baptized. There's been all kinds of confusion, all sorts of different practices about baptism. But what the Bible says is, is that as long as you're a follower of Christ and you've made a decision in here, that the natural and logical obedient step is to come out here and to be baptized, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, to identify with Jesus and say, I'm one of you. So it's a ceremonial act that is done publicly, but it's a ceremonial act. It's not part of salvation or conversion. And the Bible tells us very clearly that it's by grace we've been saved and not works, and this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God so that nobody can boast about it. And some people get so confused that salvation is, a, is a tied to baptism and that to be saved, you have to be baptized. And it's a tradition that comes from some very isolated, selective interpretations of some very isolated and selective passages of scripture that just don't hold up because baptism is a work and works don't save you. Baptism is done by another person and another person can't save you. And I've listed some scripture and some evidence in your notes to help support this. But one of the things that troubles me in my heart is that many people who come from that tradition believing that baptism is necessary for salvation also come from the tradition that teaches you can lose your salvation. And many of you are afraid 
And there's just no part of fear after salvation and faith in Christ that you should be experiencing. Baptism doesn't save you. It is simply a step of obedience saying, that's what I did and I'm one of you. Make sense? Not asking if you agree, I just wanna be clear, right? And I can point you toward many scriptures, but you can find them on your own if you research. The second thing that you need to know about this ceremony is that it's done by immersion in water. They go, oh, wait a second, I was sprinkled, pastor. Now you're making me really mad. People get sprinkled two times or in two different times of life. Sometimes it's when they're babies and also when they're adults. And I'm gonna talk about the adult time right now, but the baby time in a minute. And uh, I wanna tell you, first of all, that sprinkling was never understood by anybody as biblical, nobody. The first time sprinkling occurred was in 250 AD. That means after Jesus, there was a man who was sick and he was so sick that he could not in good conscience be immersed in water, but he wanted to be baptized. And there was some confusion with some people at that point about whether or not you had to be saved and baptized. They worked it out, thank goodness. But the doctor said, we can't baptize this man, it would kill him. And so they got together these pastors and church leaders and thought, in this case, we'll, we'll just sprinkle him. So they put water on the parts of his body that could have water on them. And it was of course good enough. I baptized a little boy one time who had Asperger's and um, he was 12 and he had some sensory issues, uh, difficulty with things in his face. And we baptized by immersion. And he wanted to be baptized. He understood his salvation. He desperately wanted to be baptized. And his mom and he came to me and they said, Pastor Rick, they said, you know, he can't put his face underwater. It just, he can't do it. Can he be baptized? Now I could have said, well, of course not because baptism is by immersion. Unless he's fully immersed, he's not baptized. I would never do that. And I said, let's do the best we can. How far can he go in? She said, I don't know. And he practiced and he practiced and he practiced and he practiced and he got to here where he could go underwater, which was huge for a person with some sensory issues like he had. And I will never forget the day I baptized him. He trusted me by allowing himself to be baptized by me that I wouldn't put his face underwater. And when I got him into here and pulled him back up, he threw his arms up in the air and said, we did it. He did. Was that believer's baptism? Oh, you better believe it. But they allowed sprinkling in conditions. And if you don't believe me, look up clinical baptism. That's what it was coined. For the next thousand years, the only time a person could be sprinkled is if they had a medical condition that allowed it or a physical restriction where it couldn't happen. And then in 1300, the Pope decided by practicality that sprinkling would be an okay method of baptism. And then John Calvin, a little later, based on some faulty theology said, yeah, why not? And is it an invalid expression of faith or your heart? No, I have one of my close friends named Ben, Presbyterian in the church that I planted in Arkansas. If we had had deacons, he would have been a deacon. My closest friend, he was saved, became a believer as a teenager and wanted to follow Jesus in baptism and his church sprinkled, so he was sprinkled. After salvation, not as a part of salvation, because he wanted to follow Christ, he was sprinkled. And he said, can I be part of this church? You know, and I mean, he was every bit as much a part of the church. I mean, membership was a different issue, but he was certainly a part of the church. He was a leader in the church. He was a teacher. He was one of my close friends and I was teaching on baptism just like this. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, it makes perfect sense to me. He said, buried with Christ in baptism, under the water means dead, Jesus was fully dead. And he said, underwater, yeah, and raised to newness of life like Jesus was raised. And he said, that's a perfect picture. Mine was incomplete. And he said, I got a problem. My parents are gonna kill me if I get baptized. And I was like, well, that's between you and your parents because you know he thought maybe he was turning his back on his tradition and he was gonna make his pastor mad that he grew up with. And I didn't pressure him or force him or tell him we couldn't be friends if he didn't do it. But he decided, you know what? I now know. And so why wouldn't I do? And I baptized he and his wife in a lake in Arkansas. And it was one of the highlights of any of the baptisms that I've ever done. 
But baptism has always been understood biblically as immersion. No question. You can't find sprinkling anywhere in the Bible, but you can find it in the church. And I'm not making fun of it, but I'm just telling you where it originated so that you can make decisions based on what you know. So those are two big ones, right? Salvation or it doesn't come through baptism. And the second one is baptism happens by immersion. But I got another big one for you. And just stay with me. If you're online, please stay with me. Um, you guys, I address the online audience every week. We have a whole lot more people who join us online than do in person. Last week, last time I checked, we had over 5,000 people who checked in long enough on our message for Facebook to consider it a through play. And so I address you guys because you're part of our church. And I I want you guys to stay with me because it's really, really important. Uh, I want to talk to you about infants and I want to talk to you about sort of a next step. Baptism happens after a person becomes a Christian. And for a person to become a Christian, they have to first of all be old enough to understand sin. They have to be old enough to understand consequences, heaven and hell, and old enough to say, I want to confess my sin and follow Jesus. And one of the worst things we can do as parents is rush our kids into baptism. Now, salvation, as soon as they're ready, absolutely. But as a child, that baptism is something that we need to really make sure that they're ready for and they understand. But many people rush their kids in infancy into baptism and for some reason believe that that has some saving effect on them. And a child can no more identify with Christ than a child can identify to be a professional football player when they're a baby. They're just babies. We do baby dedications. It's beautiful. It's not biblical, by the way. We do baby dedications. It's not found anywhere in scripture. You don't have to have your baby dedicated or christened or anything else. But dedications to me is a great thing for a family, a parent to say, God gave us this kid. We're giving the kid back to God. We're gonna raise this kid in the church and do our very best by them. And so to me, it's a good thing to do. But for a child to be baptized, it reverses an order that does at least three things. And by the way, if you were baptized as a child, I'm not making fun of you. I'm not telling you your parents were wrong. I'm not telling you you were wrong. I'm telling you that it's incomplete if you're putting your faith and trust in that and calling it either salvation or believer's baptism. The Bible says that whoever believes in Jesus, not whoever might believe at some point later on in their life, you follow where I'm coming from, right? You gotta be old enough to decide. And by the way, babies are covered under God's grace. I believe the Bible teaches in what I would call the age of accountability. And that if a baby dies before they're old enough to understand sin and to make a decision to follow Christ, I believe God's grace covers them and they go straight to heaven. And I have no question about that whatsoever after they're old enough to choose and understand they're responsible. And for some people, because of mental issues and difficulties, that never happens. And I believe they're covered under that same grace if they're unable to make that decision. But infant baptism can be dangerous if these three things, well, I'll just wanna read these things to you. First of all, it provides a false assurance sometimes to parents saying, oh, my kid was baptized as a baby. So they're Christian and they're not. I love you. That's nowhere in scripture. It's not true. And parents hide behind that saying, my child's a Christian because it four weeks old, eight days old, three months old, they were baptized. And it provides a false assurance for parents and for kids to never really embrace Jesus for themselves and to think about their own salvation. So when they get old enough and the stakes get higher, they make a decision. Now, is it a beautiful thing? Sure, it can be. Can it be a baby dedication? Absolutely. My dad was sprinkled, but then after he became a believer and understood, he was baptized. It happens. Just like the two in Acts 19, they learn more. What they knew was incomplete. So they made the decision. Number two, it can rob a believer or a person who wants to be a believer of an important and informed experience. If you're baptized as a child, as an infant, and then all of a sudden become a believer as an adult and say, well, I don't need to be baptized because I was as a child, you haven't been baptized. 
Does it mean you're not going to go to heaven? Of course not. Does it mean that I don't love you? Of course not. Does it mean you can't be around and part of our church? Of course not, but it's incomplete. And so there are at least a, a couple things that we should discuss. And the first one is, is that this isn't a real emotional decision that we need to make. It's not something we have to decide if we feel or not. It's as clear cut as black and white. And it's so much in the Bible that you can't miss it. Jesus told us to do it. So we do it. It's an act or a matter of simple obedience. And it's a beautiful picture. And here's what happens when we know and we don't do. If we know we're supposed to do something and we choose not to do it, then there are at least two things that begin to happen in our life. And there are a lot of reasons why somebody might choose not to be baptized. There was a period in my life when I was in high school that I was so worried about what other people thought that there were times when I was thinking, I wonder if I'm really a Christian. I wonder if, and I wouldn't even consider it because I was so worried about what the other kids or parents or people would think. That, oh, Rick wasn't a Christian, ha, ha, whatever. I didn't even know what they would do. But there was a time when I was so worried about other people that I wouldn't even consider the spiritual things that were really important in the condition of my relationship with Christ. So I get it. I understand that sometimes you worry about what other people are gonna think and you're just too proud to do it. And I'm not criticizing you, I'm identifying with you. And that's one of the things we offer to Christ because what's our pride? It's nothing. Sometimes it's fear because it's scary to get up there. You know, it's not really scary, but it always seems scary. I don't make you say anything when you get baptized except your name and yes. And there's a reason. Did you know some churches make you do a whole video before you get baptized? And I have really good friends who I could tell you their names, but I won't, who won't get baptized because they're terrified to be on video. And it's an obstacle people put in the way of something where there shouldn't be any obstacles. I love testimony. I love video. It's not biblical. We're certainly not gonna make it an obstacle, but I understand the stage fright is a little bit, it's a thing. But is it a big enough thing? Because when you know and you choose not to obey, this is what happens. It messes with two things. The first thing it begins to mess with, and it's not just baptism, it's obedience in general, is it messes with your assurance. The longer you go knowing that there's something unresolved that you should do that you're just choosing not to do, it begins to mess with your own assurance as to whether or not you really are a believer. Now it doesn't mess with your salvation. Nobody can take that from you, but it messes with that peace because we're not supposed to live in a state where there's something we know we should do, but we're choosing not to. And the second thing that it does is it begins to rob us of our joy because there, part, there is part of our Christian testimony, of our story that we as believers who have been saved by faith through God's grace, there's part of our story that we should be able to tell to encourage other believers that we can't tell because we haven't obeyed. And it robs you of peace, it robs you of joy, and it robs others of the blessing of being able to hear about your obedience. Now, I hope that we've arrived at the end of this at the same place where I've pointed you toward the word, I've told you I love you, I've asked you to consider truth. And if you have decided, yeah, the information I had was incomplete, I get it, I wanna do this, then awesome. There was one time when we baptized 40 people on a lake in Arkansas. And it were people just like you, people from different backgrounds, people who had different faith traditions, who realized, you know what, this is, I, I didn't know. Awesome time, if that's you, We'll plan a baptism service every single week. I love it. And there's a QR code that we're gonna pop up here on the, on the screens. That if you wanna follow that way and send a message to our assistant, Kathy, get one to Dan or myself or Brandon or Jared, you can do that. You can talk to me or Dan or Brandon or Jared personally. 
You can fill out the card that's in front of you, drop it in the box. We're not gonna hold you to anything, but we'll have a conversation with you. Take you out to coffee, I'll buy. Just coffee. Because this stuff's so important. And it's not about checking a box, friends. It's not about checking a box. It's about living a life, aligning with Jesus, being transformed and finishing well. And I want you so badly to know how badly I want that for you. Father, thank you for my friends who are here. And I pray that you would speak to us as we have opened our hearts to you and most importantly to your word. I feel words were just so inadequate to communicate something so important, something Jesus did himself. And his final words were an encouragement to go and baptize and be baptized. We don't really understand why it was so important, but it was, and that's good enough for us. So I pray that my friends would have the courage to be able to look at their own lives, their own past, to be grateful and thankful for where they came from. But perhaps if anything was incomplete, they would allow you to complete that part of the story. I thank you for your grace and your love, your mercy. Most of all today, I thank you for your truth that we can stand not on the interpretation or beliefs of one man, a group of men or a denomination, but we can stand firmly on your word, inspired by your Holy Spirit and given to us, your people. So we promise you that we'll continue to be a church that looks to you and your scripture for everything we do and everything we believe. So teach us this truth, Father, and teach us together in Jesus' name, amen.